not uh, want to go back to Acts chapter 19. I know that we are uh, actually much further than that in going through the book, but I wanted to just take a, a break from, our, from where we're at normally and uh, talk tonight about this subject of revival and a few thoughts that I have and just some challenges uh, for my own heart as well as uh, those of us here. And I hope that, that uh, we'll just take these things to mind as we've got the upcoming meetings. Uh, G. Campbell Morgan said, Revival cannot be organized, but we can set our sails to catch the wind from heaven when God chooses to blow upon his people once again. Uh, we can set the table of our hearts for revival. Uh, we can do, do inside us what's necessary. And uh, I, as the pastor, cannot uh, schedule a revival for our church. We can schedule meetings, but we cannot schedule, uh, we can't change any hearts, amen? So, and you, uh, it, it's not up to you whether I'm revived, and it's not up to me whether you're revived. It's a personal choice that we make. Uh, so when God's people work toward the common goal of spreading His truth, experiencing his power, yielding to his word, revival is possible. I want to read, uh, starting verse number 8 of Acts 19. And he went into the synagogue and spake boldly for the space of three months, disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. But when divers were hardened and believed not, but spake even that word divers is basically various, various people, were hardened and believed not, but spake evil of that way before the multitude. He departed from them, but separated the disciples, disputing daily in the school of one Tyrannus. And this continued by the space of two years, so that all they which dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. And God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul, so that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons, and to the diseases departed from them, and the evil spirits went out of them. Then certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, took upon them to call over them which had evil spirits, the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, We adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preached. They were trying to copy what Paul did. And there were seven sons of one Sceva, a Jew, and a chief of the priests, which did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? <laughs> I think that verse is just... I don't know, there's just something fascinating about that verse. That would be tremendously uh, convicting to hear, wouldn't it? From a demon. And the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them and overcame them and prevailed against them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. And this was known to all the Jews and Greeks also dwelling at Ephesus. And fear fell on them all. And the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. And many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. Many of them also which used... Curious arts brought their books together and burned them before all men, and they counted the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. So mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. Father, I pray you'd help us this evening as we just talk for a few minutes about revival and what we can do to bring it upon ourselves. In Jesus' name, amen. What, what is the cure for what ails our world today? I don't think it takes much of a genius to look around and know that the human race has uh, fallen a little short of its potential. Uh, this is not as tragic, though, as the fact that Christians have fallen short of their potential. I read about a man in India writing a friend a report about a uh, mighty work that God was doing in his church and his community. And he wrote, we are having a great revival here. Now, his language and grammar were a little off. Uh, using uh, putting B in the place of V, but uh, he might not have been 100% in the way he said it, but his sentiment was spot on. Well, that's what we need is a re-Bible, amen? We need to get the Word of God, again, to fill our hearts, change our lives. The average Christian has been defeated so long, they've accepted it as a way of life. But Jesus Christ came that we might have life, and not only life, but to have it more abundantly. You do not have to live the life of a defeated Christian. You don't, you don't have to be an old crusty. You don't have to be uh, fatigued about the things of God. We can be excited. We can be, uh, ha have the, the uh, spirit, uh, the, the, the new love that uh, the Bible talks about in the book of Revelation, uh, somewhat against thee because you've left your first love. The first love, I should have said. But uh, we can have that first love in our hearts. But too often we find ourselves overcome by circumstances, 
plagued with doubt, weak in the face of temptation, and uh, all that to really say non-abundant living. Now John 10.10, the thief cometh not but but to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. And so that is God's desire for us. So what's the cure to defeated, doubtful, circumstantial living uh, where we are overcome by temptation? The cure is revival. We need revival in our hearts. I think it is a tragedy that so very few churches have meetings anymore. I don't know how you grew up in church when, when you were younger, but we used to have meetings like we do here every year. We'd have revival meetings, we'd have missions conference, we have these different things, and And that was always, I think, an important part to the health of the church. And one of the things that I determined when I came here is that we would have a regular, at least annual, if not twice a year, special meetings where we have this opportunity to just renew ourselves. And and plus, it gives you a chance to get good preaching. Amen? So, I want to do that as well. But the Hebrew word translated revive is found in Psalm 85.6 is kaya. I'm I'm slaughtering the translation because it sounds like you're spitting when you say the actual word, but it means to make alive or to give uh, or promise life to, to recover, to restore, to save. And the verse is, Psalms 85, 6, Wilt thou not revive us again, that thy people may rejoice in thee? There is a dying world in need of revival. There is an apathetic church in need of revival. God's design is that this revival would begin with his people, which if you want to get technical about it, lost people need to be saved, not revived, but uh, Christians, we uh, apathetic Christians and the lethargic church needs to be revived on a regular basis. Second Chronicles 7.14, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and forgive their sin and will heal their land. How will we experience revival today? I mean, we, we can schedule a meeting for it, as we have, and we know how to do that. We know how to attend a revival service. But how do we experience a revival that produces life in us and reproduces life in others? That's what we want to have in each one of our Christian life. Now, to answer this question, we look at Acts chapter 19. We see what happened to a city that was turned upside down by the power of God. Uh, not surprisingly, turn me down just a little bit, Caleb, get a little bit of reverberation here. Not surprisingly, Paul was at the center of this revival in Ephesus. Now, Ephesus, in 133 BC, this city came under direct Roman control. Under the Romans, Ephesus thrived. In fact, it reached its pinnacle of success during the first and second century. And at the time of Paul, Ephesus was probably the fourth largest city in the world. It was a population of about 250,000 people. So it was a major city. And uh, this, this happened that we're reading here in the, during his third missionary journey when he's here preaching and seeing this revival. Now as we study the revival that occurred in Ephesus here, I want to see three activities that paved the way for revival here that will do the exact same thing in our church, do the same thing in our hearts as well. Revival occurs, first of all, when the truth of God is preached. Verse 8 through 10, uh, we see here that uh, the he continued, uh, let me go back to verse 8 here, and he went in the synagogue and spake boldly for the space of three months, disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. Uh, The preaching of God's word is always at the center of genuine revival. We have to have the word of God be part of this. By the way, it should be no surprise uh, to us, the Bible was everything in Paul's ministry. In Acts 17, 2, the Bible says, And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the Scriptures. His manner in nearly every city he went to was street preaching. He would often start in the synagogue until he was thrown out of there and then just preach wherever he could, uh, out in the public with the Word of God preaching the message of Christ. Now, uh, to be just to be fully transparent, uh, I'm not that big of a fan of street preaching in this day and age. I know there's a there's a I know that a lot of Bible colleges still do it and they encourage it. Uh, it's good for the preacher to learn how to be able to preach uh, in an uncomfortable situation. But I'm not a huge fan of it personally, just because I think it kind of dis 
it uh, almost marks you off in the hearers because of how many people are crazy that do that kind of stuff. Uh, but I think today a great example of this type of ministry today would be handing out gospel tracts, striking up one-on-one -on -one conversations, talking to people, and having these conversations be a help to try to get the truth of God's word out. The apostles gave a message of reason. Now, the fact that Paul was disputing and persuading, as it says here in verse number 8, does not mean he was arguing. He was not <clears throat> having debates. Another thing I'm not a big fan of, debates. I know people do it, creationists, evolutionists, different times they have debates like that. I don't think they really ever bring up any converts. I think that people are kind of stronger on either of their sides when that happens. But uh, I don't believe that's what Paul was doing. He was using logic and reason and the Word of God. You say, that, is the Word of God logical? The Bible says in Isaiah, Come, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Basically, the Bible says, look, you've got sin. You can't do anything about it. Be reasonable. Come to me, and I'll make it white as snow. And so, of course, it is reasonable for us to come to Christ. The fact that these, uh, these things were fulfilled in Jesus Christ authenticated the message of what things I'm talking about is the Old Testament. So he would bring up the Old Testament and talk about how that was fulfilled in Christ, and that authenticated his message. We see an example in boldness here. Boldness was a great mark of first century Christians. And I believe that this is because their faith was so fresh and so real to them. Now, have we not today lost the boldness in our message? I mean, we'll be bold about other things, but when it comes to Christ, it's really hard to be bold with the message of the gospel. I believe that one of the reasons is that we get used to our Christianity. It becomes kind of old hat. In Acts chapter 4, verse 31, this is in the very beginning of the book of Acts. When they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. When we keep our faith real, we keep it fresh, it will make us bolder. You remember how it was when you were first saved? Man, when I was first saved, I was only 10, but I remember the first time I went to town with Dad, I had this little Gideon Bible, and I found a kid about my age in the park, asked him if he wanted to go to hell. He said he did not, and then I walked him through the sinner's prayer. I don't know how real that was, but I tell you, I was bold, and I was excited about telling somebody about uh, the gospel. And then that wanes over the years. We get used to it, and it gets kind of old hat to us. and We just don't, uh, we aren't necess ne necessarily as bold as we once were. Keeping our faith, faith fresh and real will help us to keep bold in our witness. An example here also in preparedness. This uh, confused world that is obsessed with diversity today does not need our cliches. Uh, lots of people today, everybody that's not saved, needs to hear from Christians, whether it be co-workers, whether it be neighbors, whether it be relatives, that in their lives the Word of God is real. They need to see something that is real. They don't need just a bunch of cliches and the things that we throw around in church sometimes. They don't need professors or theologians or debaters. Uh, it's okay if you don't know the answer to every Christian uh, or every Bible question or everything that might come up. That's all right. But people need Christians who have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, a love for His Word, and aren't afraid to talk about it. A love for something will mean that you're going to talk about it, by the way. 1 Peter 3.15, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and in fear. If you love something, you will have no problem talking about it. People talk about what they love. Now, I don't per se have anything against essential oils. But do you know anybody who is ravenous about essential oils? And they'll talk about that to anybody who will listen. And again, not having anything against it, I'm just saying that's not going to stop them. Uh, you ever been around somebody who's just lost 20 pounds? They'll tell everybody how they did it and how quickly they did it and, and uh, how that you can also do it. You ever been around somebody with grandkids? You know, stuff like that. They just... Uh, people talk about what they love. They don't have any problem sharing that with you. And so we need to foster a love for the Lord Jesus Christ, a relationship with Him, His Word, and talking about it will come as naturally as anything else. Sigmund Freud. 
not a preacher. He was a godless person. But this is what he said. Religion is an illusion. It derives its strength from the fact that it falls in with our intuitive desires. In other words, he's saying we're out of our minds. We're deluded because of our wishful thinking. And so we have wishful thinking and then we use religion to fulfill that wishful thinking. That's what the world thinks often about Christians. Now, you can have a testimony that changes that perception. Now, we don't need to be weirdos, all right? We need to be uh, spirit-filled and make an impact around uh, folks for the gospel. Look at the audience here that had a mixed message. In verse number 9, diverse were hardened and believed not, but spake evil of that way before the multitude. Now, even as gifted and as bold as Paul was, not everyone believed. Hey, as gifted and bold as you are, not everybody's going to accept. Did you know that not everybody accepted when Jesus preached? Uh, not everybody believed on his message. John 6, 66. It's interesting that 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 this verse is found in 666. John 666. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Six is the number of man, and they chose man over Christ. Now, we must not allow those that reject the message discourage us from sharing the message. Amen? We need to just continue to be faithful. Not everybody is going to receive, but we need to be faithful in giving. We will find in our own lives, as seen here in Ephesus, if we're faithful... In giving the message, some will believe. And, uh, and by the way, you don't know the impact of what you're doing anyway, with, especially with Gospel Track. They're handed out. You don't often have the follow-up. Last year, the Lord's allowed me to make that little Amish track, which I'm really, uh, has, has been a blessing giving that out. And last year, we ordered 10,000 of those Amish tracks. And I think I have maybe... Uh, we ship them out to different churches as well, but also I give out a lot. And I think maybe I'm up to about, I don't know, 1,500 maybe that we've distributed. And uh, out of that 1,500, I just last Thursday a week ago, this Thursday a week ago, I spent the night at a, a converted Amish family in Wisconsin, reached with one of those tracks. And they're in a Baptist church. They're serving the Lord. Uh, the, the pastor, his good pastor friend is a great friend of Brother Jorgensen over in Elkton, uh, and, and just doing wonders for the Lord. I have another family, that's the second one, the first family I told you about last year will be here this year giving their testimony at the pastor's conference and be with us for church the next day. That's two. So, 1,500 tracks, two great stories, is it worth it? I think so, amen? I think that's great. Uh, I'd be happy if with one family out of the 10,000 tracks, honestly. We don't know what's going to come out of that. And, and that's just the ones we know. We have no idea what the Lord's done with the rest of those tracks. So uh, just be faithful. Get those things out. Uh, write letters. It was one of the things, and she's not here tonight. I wouldn't embarrass her, but Miss Eloise does a lot of that. Writes writes uh, gospel letters to people, and, and they did that every Christmas. Her and Brother Dwayne did that for years. Uh, wrote wrote uh, the full gospel to family members, friends, and sent out hundreds of those. It makes a difference, and we won't know that difference really uh, sometimes till we get to heaven. But here, the Bible says that Paul taught daily. Uh, he also taught here in the school of Tyrannus. Uh, he was a teacher in Ephesus. He owned a lecture hall here, and then Paul spoke there and uh, reached others through that. Now, Asia was miraculously reached here. Ephesus is situated in the western coast of what's known today as Turkey, and it's known in biblical terms as Asia Minor. Uh, you'll read in Revelation chapters 2 and 3, uh, letters written to seven different churches all in this region. Now, how do you suppose those churches got started? I think right here, when Paul's here preaching, and I think they started as a direct result of Paul's missionary term here in Ephesus. What an exciting step in fulfilling the Great Commission. Luke chapter 24, verse 47, And the repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. Now, do we have a part of that? Absolutely. If you give to this church, you'll see in the bullet in that little note, 15% of all the monies that come in goes to missions. So uh, 15 cents out of every dollar that you give, unless you specifically give to missions, and it all goes, but... 
uh, that goes to propagate the gospel all over the world. And you have a part of that. Uh, not only are you, if you're handing out tracts, witness to people here in your Jerusalem, you can be a part of doing it across the world too. And that's exciting, isn't it? We don't know what that's going to, what kind of fruit that's going to give. I have an idea. When we get to heaven, we'll be able to see some of that. And that's a blessing. So revival occurs when the truth of God is preached. Secondly, revival occurs when the power of God is present. Revival begins with the preaching of God's truth. When the power of the Word of God is combined with the power of the Holy Spirit, something's going to happen in our midst. And we see here that the, God's power was manifest during the ministry of the apostles. Uh, God allowed special miracles to be performed. And, and now, by the way, those would end when the New Testament was complete. 1 Corinthians 13, 8 through 10, charity never faileth. But whether they be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether they be tongues, they shall cease. Our Pentecostal friends that are, have not accepted that verse, but that's very clear in Scripture. There's a time that tongues will cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away with. Preacher, what is that which is perfect? You are holding it in your hands tonight, uh, the Word of God. And uh, that is uh, when that has come, those other uh, s uh, temporary sign gifts were done away with. Until then, the apostles relied on these sign gifts because they authenticated the validity of their message. When these people witnessed this power, they believed and knew that the message was from God. Mark 16, 20. The Bible talks about they went forth and preached everywhere and the Lord working with them and confirming His Word with signs. And so that's what miracles were for in the New Testament. That's why Jesus did miracles. That's why these apostles were able to do miracles. It validated their message. Now, an important issue to remember is that these miracles are from God and God alone. Paul... Peter, any of the other apostles who did these miracles always was very careful to let people know this power was not from them. They are just men. It came from God. 2 Corinthians 4, 5, For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves for servants uh, for Jesus, your servants for Jesus' sake. They didn't take any credit for the healing. That would be a helpful message to convey to Benny Hinn and the like, uh, that it is the Lord that does it not people. We do not rely today on these sign gifts for our ministry, but we absolutely rely on the power today that was the power that supplied those sign gifts then. It will just manifest itself differently in our lives than it did in the first century. But we still need the mighty power of God if we're going to experience revival in our own hearts or we're going to change lives around us. By the way, who says that a restored hand or a healed leg is better than a healed heart? Amen? And God's still in that business today. We see then in verses 13 through 16 how God's word was mimicked. Uh, they tried to do what uh, Paul did here, uh, and that they, of course, failed ultimately. Uh, you cannot manipulate people into following God. You cannot manipulate God's power. Uh, so this is, by the way, James chapter 2, verse 19 tells us that even the devils believe and they tremble. Uh, that that uh, as we consider the need for revival, we can't focus on our own devices. We cannot stir up revival fires with emotional music, tear-jerking stories. For that reason, we resist the temptation at Bible Baptist to go to that approach. Amen. Uh, often people equate that with revival. Have you ever been to a service like that? Where uh, I've been to those, unfortunately, emotion-driven, where the music and the message is designed to tug on the emotions with the sensational. We won't have that here. We're not going to have uh, a whole bunch of things to drive the emotions. What we will have is preaching from the Word of God, and that's what really is going to make a difference. Private, personal revival is what's needed. So revival occurs when the truth of God is preached. Revival occurs when the power of God is present. And then finally, revival occurs when the word of God prevails. Look at verse 20. This is the best description of what revival looks like. So mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. This verse speaks of the great life-changing, history-altering power of God's word. Now consider for a moment what the Bible says about itself. 
Isaiah 55, 11, So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth, it shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and shall prosper in the thing whereunto I sent it. Think about that verse for just a second. The word of God will not return void. It will accomplish that which I please. Do you think it's, it's impactful for us to use the word of God as we talk to other people? Whether it's in a note, a letter, a conversation, a phone call, a text, a, bio, a gospel tract, however we do uh, get the word of God into the hands of other people, do you think that'll make a difference? The Bible not only says it will, it promises it will. It will not return void. And he goes on further to say that it's going to accomplish what he pleases. Our job is not to determine the effect of our witness. Our job is to witness and leave the results to God. We ought to be faithful in it. Hebrews 4.12 For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. The word of God, the Bible says here, prevailed. The word of God appeared in Ephesus by the Apostle Paul. He was soundly opposed with opposition, and it prevailed. The dictionary def definition of word prevailed is to prove more powerful than opposing forces, to be victorious. Hallelujah. That's the Bible. It will prevail. The word of God, when it prevails the Savior will be magnified. This was Paul's desire above anything else, that Jesus Christ would be magnified. He always lifted him up. Philippians chapter 1, verse 20, according to my earnest expectation and my hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but with that all boldness as always sin all, also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. So Paul said, I don't care if, it, if, if it's in my life or if I need to die for the purpose of magnifying him, but in all ways, I want to magnify Him. You search the New Testament, you will not find a sermon that does not center on the person of Jesus Christ. Stephen, Paul, Peter, all through the book of Acts, we've looked at many of them. These uh, messages they gave centered around the Lord Jesus Christ. Ours ought to as well. When the Word of God is prevailing, souls will be saved. Jesus was magnified and souls were saved. Jesus predicted this would be the case. John chapter 12, verse 32, And I, if I be lifted up uh, from the earth, will draw all men unto me. Revival will begin with those who knew the Lord, and it will result in the salvation of others knowing Him also. Verse 18, look at verse 18 with me. And many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. So many in verse 9 did not. Many in verse 18 did. Uh, that's a blessing. Not everybody's going to accept the message, but some will, and that's worth it. R.A. Torrey gives a great synopsis on revival, and I quote, I can give you a prescription that will bring a revival to any church on earth. The prescription is as follows. First, let a few Christians, they need not be many, get it thoroughly right with God themselves. This is the prime essential. If this is not done, the rest that I'm going to say will come to nothing. Second, let them bind themselves together to pray for revival until God opens the heavens and comes down. Third, let them put themselves at the disposal of God for Him to use as He sees fit in winning others to Christ. That is all. End quote. Uh, the how is not so much the issue as the doing is. Uh, we just need to answer the question we sang earlier. Do we really want revival? we really want it, then we'll take these steps to make it happen. When the, when the word of God prevails, the saved will be transformed. The people who lived in Ephesus did not simply change their belief system. Their lives were literally transformed. They did not continue with their lives as they had lived before they met Christ. And this ought to be our case as well today. In our church, uh, we hopefully make it very clear that we welcome people to come as they are. You don't have to change yourself. You don't have to put on special clothes. You don't have to uh, get a haircut to come be in our church. However, we ought not to be content to let them leave as they were. There ought to be a change affected when folks come to our church for any amount of time. Second Corinthians 5.17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Gypsy Smith, 
evangelist was asked what the secret of revival is. And this is what he said. He said, go home, take a piece of chalk, draw a circle in the ground, and then stand in that circle, and then pray this prayer, O oh Lord, revive everyone inside this circle. <laughs> That's a great little thought, isn't it? Uh, we get all, you know, sometimes, and we're all guilty of it, but we'll hear a message and we're thinking, man, glad so-and-so is here. They really need to hear this. Uh, why not draw a circle around yourself and just pray, Lord, revive everyone in this circle. That's all I can control. I can't control what you do. I can't control what anybody does with the message. I can't even control you being here. Look, I'd love to take a prison wagon and go to everybody's house and drag them to the revival service. I can't do that. I just invite and hope people come. Uh, but uh, I can control this. I can make up my decision. I'm going to be here. I can make up my decision. I'm going to listen, and I'm going to apply, and uh, hopefully the Lord will make a difference in my life as well. Whether, whenever there is true revival, there is true repentance. This repentance is a response to God's holiness and to our sinfulness. We understand and realize the need of repentance. Now, we see what happened here. There was evidence of repentance in verse 19. Many of them brought things. They brought their Metallica albums, and they brought their rock music, and they brought their bad magazines. They brought all this stuff together, and they made a big old bonfire, and they burned it. How many of you have ever been to one of those? I, I, I was, when we were growing up, it was a little more common, I guess, uh, than it is today. Uh, today, you'd be burning your cell phone, I guess, because everything's in there. So it's a little different. But back in the day when we had cassette tapes, remember those things? Uh, they burned real well, too. Uh, but I remember more than once at our church when I was, uh, that I got saved, and we'd have a, we'd have a burn barrel. And after church, uh, at, on the last night of revival, we'd have a burning. And people would bring things that they shouldn't have had. They got right, their hearts right that week, and they brought them, and they uh, uh, burned them up. So that's not always a bad idea, get rid of those. A couple years ago, we had a young man saved, uh, it, uh, led a young man to Christ here, and... Um, he, a couple days later, I was over at Corey's store, and here he comes. He's got two Walmart bags walking in uh, with a bunch of stuff. And I, so I started talking to him, asked him how he's doing, and, and then I asked him what he had there, if he's selling some stuff. No, I'm just getting rid of it. And he gave it all to Brother Corey, didn't want anything for it. He's, it was a bunch of music and different things that I don't need to have this in my life anymore. I thought that was a great evidence of repentance there. These converts to them having a relationship with Christ was more valuable than their stuff. That's true repentance. The same was true in Thessalonica, 1 Thessalonians 1, 9, For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, how that you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. In your life, in order to turn toward God, what do you need to turn from? Because really to... Sometimes for us to move closer to God, there's things in our life we've got to get rid of. Habits, uh, sins in our life, and uh, whether it's a relationship, it might be godless entertainment, it might be something more subtle like pride or bitterness or something like that. You need to get rid of that. Whatever it is, when the Word of God prevails in your life, you're going to turn from that toward the living God. Don't be so foolish as to live and continue in sinful idolatry, things of the world that damage your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. That is not a good thing to do. So again, the question that we sang in the song, do you really want revival? This quote is so convicting to me. As long as we are content to live without revival, we will. We're as close to God as we want to be. Those satisfied with the status quo will have no interest in revival. Because they know that if revival is anything like what took place in Ephesus, it's going to cost them something. It's going to shake them up. And maybe that's just what we need, isn't it? In our own personal lives. Maybe we need to reset some of our priorities in our lives. Maybe we need to get a fresh dose of the fear of God in our life. We'll be thankful for all eternity, friend. You'll be thankful for all eternity for any decision that you make that brings revival to your heart. We'll never regret it. Amen? So let's pray in our own hearts and lives. I encourage you again to make every effort to be here.